What's up, everybody? Welcome to Completely Arbitrary, the podcast about trees and a few other things. Etc. My name is Alex Kroos, and I'm one of your hosts. And my name is Casey Clapp. I'm also a host. Hi, Casey Clapp. Alex Croson, AC. You old son of a bitch. Come on. That's just Sorry. not true. We, we're supposed to say, you old son of a gun. <laughs> you old son of a gun. I know. I want to know where they came up with the gun part of it. That's a good question for our listeners. Thank you for answering that, everyone. Yeah, somebody will write in and say, uh, the son of a gun comes from the oh. 1923 novel Gun <laughs> Sunners. The son of the gun. Yeah. <laughs> One day we'll read that novel. Yeah, it sounds like a good book. It's a beautiful spring day, Alex. I don't know <coughs> if you knew this. Sorry, I just coughed right into the wow, microphone. We should just <clears throat> we should shut this whole thing down. It's okay. It adds a little it adds a little humanity, I think. Yeah. Honestly, I thought you were a robot this whole time. Well, I uh, I don't know how you would think that. I'm far too emotional to be a robot. <laughs> yeah, it's the robot's dilemma, or as the a, shins say. I'm just a highly highly uh, evolved robot. Yeah. Sophisticated technology. Yeah, you have compassion. I do. You're like one of those robots in uh, um, uh, The Terminator Part 1. Oh, The Terminator has compassion. Doesn't he? He comes I started back that sentence it. as a question and I ended it as a statement. <laughs> I thought the opposite way around. I'm trying to think. Maybe it's like iRobot or something. I mean, he tries to save the kid, right? He gives a thumbs up. I think that's Terminator 2 Judgment mm, Day. Yeah, he gives that thumbs up. That's what. That's how you know that it's like, wow, he he's, cares. He's a real cool dude. Yeah, that's true. Uh, um, now, R2-D2. Now, there's a robot with compassion. Yeah, when he goes, mm-hmm. he yeah. does a little sad sound. Yeah, he does, yeah. Which... Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's probably some dumb Star Star Wars lore that explains why he has a personality. Probably. Uh, I think it's because Luke removed that little that little gummy chip. From oh his side. yeah, the um, um, Re- restrictor. <sighs> yes, restrictor bolt or something. Yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. Yep. Oh man, I'm ashamed that I can't remember. Oh, God. it's okay. I this like my favorite sci-fi. Yeah, at least historically, it's really good historic sci-fi. Man, I had an argument with somebody about what the coolest and best spaceship was. Wow, what would you say? Oh God, well I want to say Millennium Falcon. That's it's, just a classic. Yeah, it's uh, that was what I said. It's like the number one. Are we talking across all? Uh, sci-fi universes? Yes. Wow. Well, but the ones that more specifically take place in space. Sure. <laughs> that universe. I mean, as a kid, I loved uh, Boba Fett's ship, Slave One. Oh, that was pretty cool. Yeah, so it awesome. Because it, 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 yeah. yeah, it lands on its butt yeah. and it takes off and he's upright. And I, I in, in my, in, as a child, I was like, Try, I drew pictures of it mm, and I drew yeah. the, what I thought the inside looked like. Yeah. You and didn't then get... my mom got me a book. The DK books. Yes. That had all the interiors of yes. the ships, like cross sections. Oh man. I still have those. I still had those and I gave them to my niece because oh. she was getting interested in Star Wars. Yep. Good. And she loved them too. They're magical. They're the best. Yeah. Yeah. I, it took me a long time to read the word reinforcement mm. or reinforced. I didn't know what that, I had how, how to pronounce it. I see. So I called it, I, I don't know, I don't remember. My brain just skipped over it. Ran for Ked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is a beautiful spring day, Casey. Um, I woke up this morning and decided to spend all day out of the house. Mm, good choice. Something I rarely do. And I went and got a bagel uh, and some coffee. That sounds really nice. You want to hear my obnoxious uh, order? Yes, wait, for your bagel or your coffee? Both. Oh God, I do I? I got a, I'm a uh, black coffee kind of guy. I got in everything. Well, then you're going to scoff <laughs> and roll your eyes at me here. Okay. I got in everything lightly toasted with scallion schmear. With scallion. Oh. And then for my coffee, I walked over to Cece and I got a uh, iced oat milk latte. Okay. That's not so bad. It was delightful. I was expecting like, like no fat. Oh no, with I don't do any of that stuff. And all this other stuff with like uh, a one half squirt of vanilla, oh. a full squirt of sugar of some other kind. No. And then if you get it even slightly wrong, I'm gonna be upset. I have no, I have no problem with people who uh, have elaborate drink orders, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm not that fussy with my coffee. All right, I'll take whatever. I, I drink at home. I drink like Kroger brand. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> 
in the can. You got to stop telling me this. <laughs> oh gosh, I I specifically when I go backpacking, like most people, like you got you know breathe ultra light or like you know minimize weight. I bring a metal like Japanese built hand grinder. Oh wow! With whole bean coffee that I Jesus. get at some local roaster. And I I don't I don't grind it beforehand. Like you go up there, you it's, grind to order. Yeah, it's like it's like steel, so it's not it's not even like a light grinder. It's yeah, a, it's a full it's a full grinder. It's not carbon steel. <laughs> no. It's just steel. No, we're on opposite sides of the spectrum. Is what I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I can appreciate a good coffee. Whenever okay. I have a good coffee, I'm like, oh, this is a good coffee. Yeah, I just did this. Uh, what do you what do you call this hand gesture? Uh, you told me what that's called. Uh, the chef's kiss. Oh yes, I'm doing just kind of a kind of a wagging a wagging a chef's kiss yes, like a little yes. bit a little bit of paisan like, you like you're savoring something <clears throat> yes yeah i can right. really appreciate good coffee and i think i can taste it when it's good you know but also i don't give a shit about good coffee when i'm making stuff i mean i put i put a i dump a bunch of wow i dump a bunch of grounds from a can into my wow. coffee mate and i hit go i am just and i just chug it wow i accept you i accept you for who you are thank you however i, I would that. never accept your coffee for what it is well you and your coffee can go fly a kite. Well, we will. And you know what? It's going to be really nice. It's such a beautiful eat. day. Yeah, it's such a beautiful day. Go take your coffee to the park and I hope you have a great time. Yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was, I was being genuine. Go fly All a right. kite. It's I fun. Will. Thank you. I appreciate your gen- I, that good pivot. Not. Wow. Well, it sounds like you had a great day with your coffee and your bagel. I did. And then I went to, uh, I, just to finish up the day, I, yeah. went, I went and hung out with my friend Ty at mm-hmm. uh, Cloud Cap Games in Selwood. He owns, yeah. he owns this game store. That's right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Board and card games. It's a delightful store. We just chatted and and had a good old time. Oh, that's much, really good. I hope everyone goes to this game store and chats with Ty. Yeah, I hope so. It's on. It's a Cloud Cap Games in Selwood, Oregon. Mm-hmm. Ty, one of, he and his wife, Jess, two of my favorite people. Such a delight. Very delightful people. Casey. Alex. Speaking of delights, we have a delightful tree to talk about today. That's right. Shop local. Was this my, do you think this was my best transition yet? Singly. Until I pointed it out? Without question. I think even after pointing it out, still. Wow. Thanks, Casey. Yeah. Now people are also who would have been aware because it was so smooth. Now they're like, there was a transition there. Mm. That's what I think. It's like at the end of the the Sixth Sense when they're like, he is a goat. And then you go back and you watch all, it's like all the red stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I haven't watched that movie. It scared me. I, I still have not seen it. Oh, yeah. Ever? I'm an adult, and I still have yet to see it <laughs> because I have this deep-seated thing. It took me years to watch Jurassic Park again. R- Jurassic Park? I swear to God, that movie completely destroyed me as a child. That's I couldn't incredible. flush the toilet. I had to jump under my pillows or my bed, oh, the my, toilet, my sheets. The, the toilet thing is curious to me. It is it because loud. of the lawyer that... Oh, because it's loud. Yeah, it was just loud. It's like you, you flushed it and I couldn't hear what was going on and I was worried that there would be certainly oh. a velociraptor outside the door. Wow. Yeah. I, I feel like I had that same, like the flushing, the scared of flushing. Like mm-hmm. I would flush it and then like run out the bathroom. Yeah, jump under the covers and then I was safe. Yeah. Yeah, to this day I still like cover my toes. <laughs> anyway. You got to do the rap. Yeah. What was your, what, what were you talking about earlier? I, I can't even remember. Well, I was talking about this week's Tree of the Week. That's right. The fantastic bubble gum, th- uh, <laughs> Umbrella thorn. You did it. The umbrella thorn. The umbrella thorn. Unrelated to the hawthorn. Oh, but another thorny tree. A very thorny tree. So Casey, this week we are, how do we want to travel from Ireland to Africa? I say we go by dirigible. We hop into a dirigible. Mm -hmm. And what is a dirigible now? A dirigible, Alex. What is a dirigible? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an airboat, an oh, air machine, right. like a, like a Led Zeppelin. Yes, well, more. Yes, it's, it's very similar to that. Like a steampunk sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we have we have mechanical monocles. Yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, you got to see how you got to be able to look really far. It actually, my mind zooms out so I can see the ground, identify the trees oh, from okay. our lofty expanse, and my zooms in ah. so I can see the detail. Mm. And that's sort of why we make a good pair. That's exactly right. Well, we hop on over to, uh, we we float on over a very slow journey. I think it probably took, takes us about six months. It only took some people like, uh, like 27 days to get around the earth, didn't it? Uh, it around the world in 27 days or something? Yeah, that's a book. Yeah, they they did it on a, in a blimp. That's right. Not a blimp. That wasn't a blimp. That was a. I think it was a dirigible. 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 I like how you say things. (laughs) And we land in what? The savannah? Yes. Uh, African savanna. The African savanna. The Sahel, if you will. And I go, holy shit, it's hot. Mm -hmm. And also, what's that tree? 
And uh, Casey, what happened? Nothing. I was going to take a drink of this kombucha and I decided not to, so I put it back. Got <laughs> a puzzled look on your face. Because <laughs> I was like, why am I doing this? Sorry to call you out. That's okay. You just, you just have to, everyone will have to forgive us. All right, let's focus. We see an umbrella thorn. That's right. What are we seeing? What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? Describe for us the experience. All right. So again, I am not as worldly as I wish I were, but unfortunately, the internet exists and I love this tree. Mm. I'm familiar with some of their kinds of trees and this is what used to be an acacia. Oh. Are you familiar with that? Well, acacias, uh, no. Well... I will tell you, Alex. Why, was I, why did I almost <laughs> I know, think like, that why? I was familiar? I think I'm mixing up with Aricar- Aricarias. Oh, sure. Yeah, this is completely but different. I've heard of Acacia. Yeah. All right. We are landing our dirigible in a very wide expanse. All of the savanna animals run away because they're like, there's a dirigible. I got to get out of here. Yeah. And they put on their monocles and they run away. Okay. Uh, we land. We get on the ground. It's a kind of an arid landscape. There's not a whole lot of lushness to it. It's kind of, you know, the classic. There's a herd of lions over there, you know. Have you ever seen The Lion King? I have seen The Lion King. It is a tree that you would see them hanging out underneath, you know. For sure. When, they, when, when, the, when they're when they bouncing through all the animals and they're all standing up and they're singing like uh, one of their happy songs, yes. Nala and uh, Simba. I will say as, as uh, someone who grew up in the United States, almost every piece of media that depicts Africa includes a depiction of the umbrella thorn i think so yeah it's 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 like the outline of it is pretty iconically it totally is uh, african and sahara savannah yeah savannah Sahara. well not quite the sahara that's a desert it has different kinds of trees okay or no trees but it is but honestly it's actually for good reason in this case because this tree is super super common down there there's a couple different species that are super closely related to it and this one used to be acacia as i said but no longer is it's now vachelia tortilis vachelia tortilis vachelia tortilis it sounds like a kind of pasta it's absolutely something you would order at a pasta restaurant oh yeah totally and it would just poke your mouth a lot and they would say what (laughs) say vachelia tortilis well anyway it is a um it is an iconic tree of africa and here is why it grows just south so if you if you're looking at africa the very top is the sahara Mm actually the very 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 top is like just north africa it's got kind of a different thing but in big broad strokes you have the sahara desert on the very top yeah and then as that transitions down as it goes south All of a sudden, you start to get into a little bit more arid landscape, but it's more of a a Great Plains. That's the classic savanna in like uh, the sub-Saharan area. Okay. So it's like... It's like a midway point between the desert and the jungle. Yes, exactly. Okay. And it's like a very long form transition between the two. Cool. So there's wet and dry seasons and there are lots of different grasses and very few trees that are spread out pretty pretty intensely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say it's very similar to something like the American Southern Midwest, like in Texas and some parts oh. of Arizona, New Mexico. Cool. It's about that latitude, right? Uh, no, actually, I looked at that. It's actually like a full like section of latitude below oh, or two. So it's okay. it's close, but not close enough to be like, yeah, that's <clears throat> that's you know the reason why. I got you. However, it is. Um, it's le- a little less rocky, um, but of course, it's a huge landscape. It's, it goes from the entire. Um, this is, area is called the Sahel. S a e s a h e l. I believe. Sahel. And uh, what is curious about it is that it also kind of goes and grows on the eastern coast all the way down into South Africa. So it kind of skips around the sort of big central, like the Congo, like yeah. extra intense tropical forest, kind of skips around it on the coast on the east side and then comes back down into South Africa Interesting. inside of the, the lower section of the, of the continent. So, um, unless it's like the tropical sections or the absolute desert section of um, Africa, it is kind of an iconic tree for almost everywhere else. Mm. So, it kind of makes sense that you would see it. Unfortunately, it also is, um, I think, like 
people just don't know much about Africa. So they're like, well, we don't know what else. Let's just put that one on there. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, sure. it, which happens all the time. It's like, well, there's a lot more than that, but okay, cool. Yeah. African portrayal in Western media is, ex- is just a monolith. Oh, it's, it's awful. Yeah. And I know. The, I think monolith is the wrong term, but I hope you understand what I'm saying, um, everybody. I think so. It's like we have like three things that are like, quote, African. Yeah. It's, it's pretty <clears> disgraceful. <throat> yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, I think we do the same in Western media with um, uh, like South America and things like. Oh, I would you're say, from yeah, Central South America. Every culture uh, in the world, we do that with every culture. In yeah, the world. we we kind of whittle it down to like one or two things. Ah, that's so true. That you can point at and say that is so Chinese. Yeah, or, it's like oh well. Yeah, that may be this very specific section. Yeah, right. it's just like saying all you know any place of a certain vastness is the same. It's like, well, that's just impossible. It For just sure. can't be true. Same thing with any forest, even, you know, I, so obviously, I think in trees, of course. Of course. And so if you're looking down through Africa, just like you were saying, uh, there's the, uh, like the Sahara and there's a specific tree. I can't remember the name of it. We'll find it. And that tree grows in the Sahara desert and it like sends these gigantic roots straight down to like the, this, the lowest, deepest water. Hmm. And it's just like this one singular tree that every now and then grows out there. Then there are the oases that have like palms and have been have uh, human inhabitants for thousands upon thousands of years, and those have like completely changed like an entire section. Like in um, uh, lore of Arabia, there are like these huge oases that had like date palms and people that live there and they grew all these different things. Yeah. So you think of like the palm trees and this kind of weird sub semi-tropical. And then you also have like South American plants and like gigantic mountains that are like subtropical, but at the same time high elevation. So they're really cold all the way down to this intense jungle jungle you know the congo river is so deep in certain places that they don't even know what's down there really yeah and it's also rushing so fast like through certain gorges yeah and it's like 80 or 100 feet deep they're like we don't we don't know and we can't go down to look yeah. because it's too intense of like a uh, torrent it's like the mississippi river flowing through something like the grand canyon okay we got to get james cameron on the case yeah we do yeah he can get a boat down there yeah, you know, a little submarine yeah i read an article about it they found like this fish or something there it's like a blind fish that lives in these incredibly deep areas in the congo river Hmm. in like this crazy gorge that has like no eyes that's cool because it's so deep and the water is so kind of uh, muddy because it has so much uh like sediment in it yeah you just can't see anything. And it's going like 100 miles an hour. Yeah, it's insane. <clears throat> so you have that. You have like these crazy tropical forests where you have literally gorillas living there. Yeah. And then you keep going south again. You get these really dry savannas with these trees. And then you have baobab. I could go on. Summation, Africa is an incredibly diverse place. It is a place that's on my list to go. I just want to like travel through it north to south and just see how it changes. That'd be sick. Anyway, we're talking about one specific tree. It is the umbrella thorn, yes. Vercellia tortilis. Vercellia tortilis. They call it that. I love um, saying that. Yeah, Vicelli, it's named after this dude. He was um, uh, uh, another botanist uh, plant collector working for the East India Company, I think. Okay. Uh, over in China, he was collecting plants. Cool. So they named it after him, and it's, in fact, um, super closely related to a bunch of other things in the pea family. Pea? Yes. Did you know that the pea family is the third largest family of plants, or of trees more specifically, I guess really? I should say? Yeah, isn't that wild? Casey, that's a fantastic fun fact. I'm just absolutely stunned by that. We got to have a we gotta have a dumb pun. Uh, maybe somebody can come up with one. Please help us. We're not doing it. We came up with one dumb pun. <laughs> For like a tree fun fact, like a little, yeah. and we could play a little sting that goes, yeah. fun fact. <laughs> fun fact. We need like a stamp. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to be like a Nickelodeon show waiting to happen. I think we are on our way. Yes. Uh, I could see us uh, 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 animated. And, yeah. Getting slimed. Yes. Oh uh, God. How I'd love to be slimed. You know, I got slimed once. As a, as a child? Yeah. At, at the Nickelodeon Studios? Yeah. Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. <laughs> Nickelodeon Studios. <laughs> <You're so laughs> oh, good well, answer. Casey, let's talk morphology of the yes. Acacia uh, Vicelli Tortaliato. You got it. All right. So it's in the Fabaceae, which is the most fabulous of all the families. Wow. Obviously. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's the pea family. It has a bunch of different trees in it, and a lot of them, uh, especially down in these sorts of areas, um, the mesquite is in that in this family. Really? The locust trees, the um, albizia. In fact, I actually I, I compiled a list, and I really um, would love it if you could try to sound out many of these oh different things. All right, so just quickly go to the notes that we have taken for this. I got them right here, Now case. go to the very bottom of that page. Somebody's prepared. Someone, and, and read the, there's a thing that says, Alex, <clears throat> try to pronounce these tree genre in the pea family. You idiot. Why did you type that? <laughs> I didn't. You, hey, everyone in there, I didn't do that. Acacia. 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 Albizia. 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 You're doing so good. Is that right? Albizia, yeah. I'm getting no confirmation, Casey. <laughs> That's because I just want you to keep going. I just want you to rapid fire. <laughs> Bauhinia, ba- Bolusanthus, Berkia, Calpurinia, Coloformis, Superium. <laughs> you just, you col- just added in cor- an entire other like syllable. Cordilla. Uh, Cordilla. No, Cordilla. There's only one L. Yep. Uh, Cyclopedia. <laughs> uh, Dicrystaxis. I'm going to post these so everyone can see what Alex is reading. Erythrina. Ere, every, uh, erythropenilium, <laughs> Faldrebia, Indigofera, Indigofera, in, Indigofera. I like Indigofera. Yeah, Indigofera, Indigofera. In, yeah, I, I, I can Indigo for that. Yeah, see, that's bow, bow. that's the best for like uh, for <laughs> using it as a pun. Indigo, Indigofera. Yeah. Fera. Yeah. Mend, mand, mandulia. Mandulia. Pe, Peltroforum. Uh, Peltroforum. Fillin, fillin, up, op, Optera. I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah, I only got three more. Pilio stigma. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, well, I recognize stigma. Shlodia. Shot, shotia. Using shot, shotia, shotia. Maybe it's like shoshia. And xanthocaryx. Like Nova Scotia. It's just shosha. Oh, shosha. I'm making it up. I'm not sure. Either. I love shosha. Let's do shosha and. Yeah. Zan- what am I reading right now? What Xanthocercis. is this? What is this whole list? What am I doing? These are a bunch of trees that grow down in Africa, and these are their different genres. In the pea family. These are all pea family oh, trees. Oh, and acacia is is the ve- the vouchelleria. Yes, there's also other acacias. Uh, like there is acacia something. <laughs> You're sweating. Are you okay? I, just, I don't feel so good. Uh, I, I'm I'm not the good game person here, so I was reading through these, and I was like, I can barely pronounce half these. I want Alex to try. Yeah, everybody loves to laugh at the sad clown <laughs> you did great Thanks. well that's those are all the fun genre okay. genus names for a bunch of things in the pea family i do want to get into the morphology of yes. the uh <laughs> i'm about to we just had to take a quick right turn yeah down. it Alex, was so speak Latin fun real fast <laughs> okay at the time of my life <laughs> I'll focus. All right. So um the thing that has to do with pea family is they always have a pea pod Wow. Classic pea pod. That's awesome. Including like peanuts. Those are in the pea pod or those in the mm, pea family. Mm-hmm. Uh, clover. It's in the pea family. The, clover. Uh, yeah, clover. Wow. Like you, you, know, you go out in the lawn, there's yeah. clovers. And clovers bees. have little pea pods? 100%. Well, really? They would if you let them grow into oh, doing that. Oh, okay. But it's also, it's not quite the pea pod that you would expect. Sure. It never is. Yeah. It always, they, they're just basically to have a pea pod. It has a a long dehiscent fruit, which means it just dries up. Sometimes they don't always dry up. Dehiscent, yes. meaning uh, that it falls apart. Yes, when you're talking about cone morphology, exactly. Oh. But in this, dehiscent means more just it's dry versus okay. uh, dry and it'll kind of pop apart. Oh, great. So um, some of them would pop apart. Some of them don't pop apart in different genre, different uh, areas within the Fabaceae. Is vanilla in the pea family? Uh, I don't believe so, but okay. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, otherwise, basically, you have to have um, two suture lines is what it's called. So if you ever see like a big long pea pod of some kind, and you can usually split it, right? Down uh-huh. the, and yeah, you yeah, have yeah, two yeah. different equal sides. Right. That's the thing for pea family. They have two suture lines, one on one side. Okay. And then they have those bean, <clears throat> little bean things in mm-hmm. there. And they also have um, usually flowers that have... Two petals to the side, and then I think one petal up and two petals down, or something. I think there's five. Oh, five petals. Yeah, and so you, if you, uh, if you ever see a pea, just the standard pea growing in a garden, and yeah. you look at that flower, the pea family flowers always have like those, uh, that kind of shape, where they have two or so petals that come down and have this big scoop at the bottom. A kind star of shape, right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. And so they will. That's how you know you set it apart. You have that kind of flower, and then you have these pea pod like fruit. 
They are wild all over the tropics. There's just pea family stuff all over the place. Interesting. And so they have these cool pods. Now, this one, our umbrella thorn, you can tell them apart because instead of having these long pods that hang down, uh-huh. you have these little tiny pods that are literally scrunched up like tiny little like springs that are just loaded. They just Aww. go, Whoop. that's what the um, tortilla means because they're torted and curled up. I imagine almost like a, a accordion bellows. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm going to yes. Google this. Yeah, give it a quick Google. It's more like uh, a cinnamon roll. Wow, I'm, ex- like I'm so excited to see it. Spiraled and smashed together. Okay, I looked up umbrella thorn pea. Yes. Uh, Look up maybe the f- pod. Okay. Rather than the pea pod. Um. Uh, hold on. You'll find it. This is scintillating radio. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I see it. Yeah. Okay. They look like, um. wow, they look like uh those gummy peach rings. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, no, totally do. That's exactly it. Yep. So they, uh, they grow and that's a, a really telltale way to identify them if you're ever down in Africa, because there's a couple different kinds of species that look really similar. Of the acacias? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the other thing about these, which I thought was really fascinating is that, um, just like most things that grow down in this kind of area, even in, um, acacias and mesquites that grow down in Arizona, New Mexico, sort yeah. of the, the, um, North American desert area, same thing with the species that grow down in South Africa because they kind of had the same things going on where millions of years ago there were animals that would uh, browse on them. So they developed thorns and that's why a lot of times like esquites and acacias and umbrella or the umbrella thorn, like it used to be acacia. So I keep on referring to it as an acacia. I see. They developed thorns. I really love using the word uh, browse for eating here and there. Oh yeah. yeah. And I like, I like the idea of... Uh, and looking in the fridge at, at 11 p.m. I'm just browsing. I'm, I'm just browsing. Yeah, don't worry about it. Casey! <laughs> just eating a couple little bits of this. A piece of mortadella. Yeah. A little bit of cheese. Yeah, did you just expl- exclaimed my name. Yes, and it is because we need to take... We're a, not even done. We gotta quick, wait. No, we can't. We gotta take a break. Ah, all right. Sounds We'll be good. right back with more Completely Arbitrary... Welcome back to Completely Arbitrary, the podcast about trees and other related topics. My name is Alex Croson. Hi, good morning. This is Casey Clapp also. We've just come back from a bit of a break, and we have some explaining to do. We were a little bit off, but we have our best correspondent here to talk about what's going on. Alex, welcome. Welcome. Oh, I thought I was. I thought you were. I thought I had to do a character. I was hoping you would. Here's the deal, everybody. (laughs) This is this went really well, Casey. The worst NPR host. So much dead air. The first half of this episode, Casey and I will be the first to admit that it was a bit much. My hair was standing on end. We were fueled by a ticking clock. We were disorganized. We were tan- disheveled. Disheveled. We were tangent heavy. If we were water and tangents were hard minerals, mm-hmm. we would be like gray water. I think that's true. We would have probably found every crack and yeah. gone into it. Yeah. I'm talking about tap water when it's like heavy. Oh. Min- there's lots of minerals, like oh. hard water. You know? Oh, I was thinking like water running through. Well, a cliff. See here, we have again. Uh, we're we're off sync tonight, so we wanted to come back in classic NPR style, a well produced show mm. for everybody involved. We had a meeting. Yes, and the that meeting was went our very well. Time bomb. Yes, and suddenly Casey was in the middle of describing the morphology of acacia <laughs> tortellinis. That's it. And I real I looked at the clock, and we had exactly one minute to get into this meeting. <laughs> And we did it. So I gave us a heart out, and it was a lot, and we're here to apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Moving on. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) Okay, Casey, let's continue our discussion of the morphology of the, uh, I cannot remember the name of this tree. I know. The umbrella uh, umbrella thorn. The umbrella umbrella thorn. thorn. Oh, gosh. Okay. The umbrella thorn. It's a tree. Vachelia. Tortilus. Yes, we're all back on the same page. All right. Let's continue 
last we were talking, I believe we were talking about peas. We, we could were, easily go yeah. back and listen. Well, we'll give it. I'll give you a quick synopsis because I'm sure everyone also has had a meeting in between the break and now. As you do. So this is a tree. It used to be in the uh, genus Acacia. Now it's in a different one. Okay. Uh, Vichelia. And it is in a pea family. Fabaceae. Again, the most fabulous family. Super fab. So the uh, these are alternately arranged leafed trees. Okay. And what that obviously means is you have a node, you have instead of being an opposite, two branches coming yeah. out, you got, you know, they're out. I alternate. know what that means. Yeah, you get it. I, I, I'm preaching to the choir over Look here. Look at me. Yeah, I'm, you know what am I? I'm cone into the forest. Do you think I can tell people I know about trees? I think so, yeah. If someone says something to you, you can you can just like it. You don't have to be like, oh, you can just be like, yeah, yeah, heart, I get it. I want eventually for you to give me some sort of certificate Yeah. that says that I've graduated to like tree novice oh you know i i I had not thought about this sort of license i kind of feel like i need to create it's like a certification program yeah but surprise me with it yeah i will all right yeah you okay you got it deal thank you well you haven't got there yet kiddo (laughs) if you're here i would have rustled your head oh man i would have fucking been so mad (laughs) sorry all right glad i didn't do it all right so uh obviously or alternately excuse me arranged leaves yes on this tree uh it doesn't grow very tall up to maybe about 50 feet and why it's called the umbrella uh thorn is a it has thorns and b it grows like an umbrella boy does it ever you know man it's uh, we were talking about that before the break but i'm going to get to it in a second because i realized i should explain one thing first okay on the way What's that? So, oh, I just had them on the way. Oh. The stipules. That's what I was going to explain. Oh, that's okay. Jesus. You're fine. You're not even listening. You are. I'm just kidding with you. Get out of here. I'm looking at pictures of Umbrella Thorn and yeah, finally see? putting putting the pieces together <laughs> that it looks like an umbrella. Yeah, there you go. It's because it grows out and it ends up growing wider than it grows tall. Yes. And then animals will browse on the bottom and eat all the leaves. There it is, browsing again. Yeah, right? that's great. So they'll browse it. And so the tree can't grow any lower because it's always getting eaten. So it ends up growing out amazing and because there's so much water and uh or lack of water because it's a drier area it doesn't grow very tall because it the higher you get the more water you have to use the wider you go the more you shade the ground underneath you and you don't have to deal with so much evaporation hey that's really fun yeah isn't it great so uh what happens is uh it starts uh it has these leaves and those leaves grow out and they are very kind of small leaves but here's a fun one for you alex Hmm. it is a or the leaf is bipinnately compound Whoo! okay Uh i can do this all right what does that mean bipinnately correct compound now to me that means that the the leaflets on this compound leaf come out in pairs not necessarily but yes, they're they're oppositely arranged. No, no. they're 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 alternately arranged. Uh huh. Uh huh. But they're binately compound. No, that's what you said. No, I said bipinnately compound. Bipinnately compound. Yeah. Well, clearly I don't know. Well, I like you trying to figure it out. Here's this. Here it is. That means I'm upset each, with myself. Each. Don't be upset, Alex. You're fine. I felt like I was right on the verge of understanding what that <laughs> meant, and it slipped away. Like you're <laughs> trying to remember a dream that you just had. Grasping at straws. I'm like, oh wait, I had it. Yep. No, it's gone. Nope. In this case, what it means is that each pinnately compound leaflet is also broken into pinnately compound leaflets. Wow. Ah! This is a meta tree. Yeah, it's super meta. The leaves, at least, for certain. Dude, the leaflets are leaflets. <laughs> the leaflets are made of leaflets, man. <laughs> That's impossible. You're right. That's I, it, though. I've seen it. Yeah, so every time, so it has that uh, that initial s- the petiole comes out, and then it splits into little leaflets, and then mm. each one of those leaflets are bump, 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 bump spin to individual leaflets on top of it. We will absolutely Pinna. be uh, including a picture of this. Oh, it looks- certainly. Awesome. So, uh, A, and there's a couple trees that are like that. Uh, not a lot, but especially the ones in the pea family and tropical trees, actually. A lot of them have these p- bipinnately compound or just pinnately compound leaves. So, once you are looking closer at it, you see that, and then you're like, well, what is that? There are a bunch of thorns on the bottom of those leaves. On the bottoms of the leaves. Yes. Right at the very base, there are these little thorns that pop out, <gasps> um, They're and they're called... Um, uh, well, they're, they're, they're modified stipules are what they're called. Okay. And basically what this means is that um, a stipule is a bit of a, um, it's a modified leaf part that grows right at the base of the petiole or kind of adjacent. Sometimes they're on the bottom of the petiole. Yeah. But it's like little bits of leaf blade or modified leaf stuff 
that's not quite up with the rest of the leaf where you would see it, like the leaf blade, you know? Okay. Uh, willows do this. Roses have this. They have little petioles, like basically little wings on the bottom of their leaves. Yeah. A couple others. Um, but in this case, it's called a spinescent stipule. Oh, boy. That's that great? That's fun. Yeah, spinescent. Sp- spinescent stipule. Yeah. I feel like that's something that you get in trouble with. Like, we caught you with the spinescent stipule. <laughs> in like in like Harry Potter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not mine. It's these it Hermione's. She's like, yeah, it was mine. I'm not gonna make those. What do you think of spines? I hate to take us. Well, I don't hate it. I guess. <laughs> what well, do you think a spinescent stipule is? Ooh, a spinescent stipule would be when someone says something like, uh, I, "I, I think it's a rule." Like, oh. like, like if they do this, then they grow spines. Oh, that's great, Case. Yeah. I was trying to think of it as like a toy that you shouldn't have, like a remember oh, all. Oh, I see. But it's like, uh, but it's like. Uh, you can have a certain kind of, sp- of stipule, but not a spinescent one. Kind of shifting rings, like. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Kind of flowing in a figure eight pattern. Oh, is that a spinescent stipule? <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. You're not supposed to have that. I thought they stayed making those. <laughs> they did, and I got this from he who shall not be named. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Sorry, that took a dark turn, didn't it? Anyway. No dark artifacts allowed in this school. Yeah, sorry. Whing. You'd get you get banned from Hogwarts for that kind of yeah, talk. Yeah, you get zinged with a zinger from a wand. Yes. I forgot. I I didn't read the last of those books. I think it's zingus is the <laughs> spell. Sorry. Yeah, you're probably right. Anyway, it basically just means that the stipules, those modified leaf parts, become really sharp and thorny. Okay. But technically they're spines because they're leaves. Don't worry about it. I will not. Um, but what's fun about them is that they have these two little tiny ones, and they're right at the base, little in pairs, and they either have two little tiny ones that are curved, or they have a really long one that's sharp. And they can either have two of big ones, two little ones, or one big one, one little one. Wow. Yeah, it's really wacky. That's fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll have some photos, and if you look, uh, if you go to our website and you go to the extra information, there'll be a great link to a, a website that has a, just a fantastic amount of information on this I tree. love it. And you go to it, you look at it, and whenever it gets bit, those thorns, the big thorns will grow. So it's a little, everything's you know chilling out, got little mm. thorns, but then any time that an animal goes and like takes a bite out of it, whing! Ooh, it's got a little the next pa- one. Pinocchio syndrome. Yeah, exactly. It, it grows out these things. Yeah, but the Pinocchio syndrome, yeah, it's, it's, the tree's not lying. Yeah, it, 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 yeah you tried It was best. a lateral move. It was close. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so it looks really cool. It has these modified, uh, these two different kinds of modified stipules that are really pokey. And they... Uh, they have these cool, yeah, we already talked about everything else. They're beautiful trees. Uh, flowers? Oh my gosh. Cones? Oh, I can't believe I forgot that. No cones. We already got the fruit. The fruit's those little spiral. Oh yes, the pea pods. But the flowers, oh my God, they are so beautiful. The flowers are like these little balls of, like just like little puff balls, almost like um, uh, a little bit more textured cotton ball that yeah. smells really good. And it's kind of like a, a kind of creamy white color. It's uh, I'm seeing a lot of yellow ones. Uh, they, they're, I, I'm not sure if they're always yellow. Maybe they sometimes are yellow. Okay, maybe it's a dead one. There's that's also like kind of graying. Yeah, and, and there's a, there's a couple other ones that are uh, different colored. So like, there's another kind of acacia that is a different um, uh, that is like super super yellow. I see. Um, but that one's not quite the same one. You can tell because that one the spines are all the same size. I also see one here, Casey. Uh, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure to save this photo so we can put it online. Oh, yes, on our Instagram. But it has kind of it's it looks like uh, the the yellow part of the flower sort of looks like a pineapple shape. Uh huh. And what would be the top kind of fronds of the pineapple? Yeah, it's like a big bushy pink fluff. What? <laughs> you got to show me these. I can't see the photo that you're yeah, looking at. Yeah, we're across at, the room this. from each other, but. Well, uh, and it's way too much work to to turn my monitor around. Oh, I'm not. Yeah, there's a me, wall there. It's very cool. Ah, rad. You're like, listen, I'm not going to show you, but it's rad. <laughs> you don't know what you're missing, man. <laughs> I never do. <laughs> well, that's what they do. And that's the, the same thing. You were all those tree uh, families or genus that you were reading. Genre. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the um, albizia is the silk tree or the mimosa. 
they also have really these just insanely puffy flowers. Okay. They just look, they look like just, a, they're, I think they're actually a bunch of stamens that actually come out. Um, but they are just these like really big, gigantic puff balls that look very stringy, kind of like the, the hairs on one of those old trolls. You remember those little guys? Absolutely, I do. Yeah, it's just kind of like that, but more fine. Well, I think I think that might be what I'm looking at. This, okay, like, yeah. this other acacia there you go. flower. Well, so uh, this is the thing though. Um, their leaves and their flowers and their little twigs Twigs are delicious. Oh, Casey, you have brought us to the, the centerpiece. Yes. <laughs> a little podcast lingo that we've, that we've created a little behind I the scenes. I term it the meat. <laughs> Wait, didn't I call it the meat? No, no I called you it the called meat. It you the meat. hated the meat, but I insisted. Hey, I didn't hate the meat. Yeah, I guess that's true. Casey, yeah. if these things are so delicious uh-huh. and they're so high up, I can only think of one animal that could really, truly mwah, appreciate could really get into it. The umbrella thorns, yep. delicious foliage. Is it? And that is the giraffe. Elephant. What? Oh, what? Oh, God. oh shit. Okay. Yeah, I'm just kidding. You're right. Uh, the giraffes and like monkeys actually eat the pods. Uh, monkeys and baboons will eat them. Fantastic. And uh, elephants will browse on it as well. And some like um, like kudu and like certain um, uh, deer-like hoofed animals. Oh yeah. Will, like stand up on their hind legs and snatch some of the lower leaves. Cute. It is, but you have to give it to them for their balance. Like it's incredible. Like, oh they're yeah. They're standing on you know basically little tiptoes. Right. Stunning. I love um, all those those kinds of like deer adjacent animals oh there's so many I like know. just just so many to even think of and yeah. someone even looks so alien a- yeah alien alien tim alien yeah yeah that's tim alien they look alien tim alien the alien <laughs> <laughs> yes they do and like some are even really small there's one in south america that's like a, a foot and a half tall oh is it the pick pick mm, yeah it might be yeah yeah well, we're not talking about these little tiny ones. We're talking about the big ones. We're having a hard time today. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We got to do another uh, NPR intro. Where, uh, yeah, we can focus. All right. We'll be right back. We're going to reset again. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Welcome back. I'm just kidding. We're still here. We're talking about giraffes. So um, this is one of the quintessential examples of um, way back when. Actually, let's take a quick step back. Have you heard of evolution? I'm f- Well, I don't. Listen. Yeah. I don't believe in that hocus pocus. It's pretty hocusy and pocusy. You're right. Hocusy. But some people, uh, some people thought about this as an idea. They said, "Well, what, 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 what about these fossils? Where did these come from?" Right. Are you talking Darwin? Darwin, yes. But there's many other people who had this. Yeah. This question in the late 1700s, early 1800s, fossils became like a a thing. Like in the science communities of of Britain and the Royal Society, they were really starting to find all these really cool rocks. Interesting. So we started looking at them saying, well, look at this. This kind of looks like the bones of this animal. Mm. Kind of looks like the bone of this animal. But it was just specifically different. And they started obviously building up these huge collections. And they started to realize maybe creation wasn't invented the way the Bible said. Uh Uh-oh. I know. I always bring religion into it because it has such a huge thing on our culture. But this was a huge, huge deal way back when. Oh, people weren't people killed over this stuff? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Darwin was like ostracized, like all these, you know, things. Science, um, way back when in like Greek times um, and the the folks, um, the Arabian uh, Arab scientists they were also extremely religious and spiritual people Mm -hmm. but um in these old cultures two thousand years ago science and religion and spirituality they were all put together all the same thing okay not until like the last 300 years or so were those 400 years did they start to split apart that's wild to me yeah we've gotten so much done in such a short time (laughs) it's it's man that that graph is insane (laughs) wow but yeah, so we started to really like consider this and it was it was not it was not a good idea. It's very taboo to consider that maybe all those animals did not get on the ark and yeah. then flow or it then released them all back into the wild and they repopulated the entire world. That's not quite how it worked. Yeah. Turns out. So people started coming up with ideas. They said, "Well, how how do we go it may be what happened is that we had all these animals that existed and then they just slowly over time changed. And everyone's like, that's, that's crazy. Like that is, that just doesn't make any possible sense. And so we had people start to come up with different theories as to how that could happen. Okay. The two big ones that came up 
were what is called Lamarckian evolution. Have mm. you heard of this? No, absolutely not. Well, have you heard of Darwinian evolution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, these yeah, were yeah, the yeah. two big, big names at the time. Okay. Um, what is what is this guy's name? I forgot his, his name. It's a uh, Lamarck is his name or is his last name. So everyone would just call him a Frenchman. Uh, Yes, he was, yes, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Wow, what a great name. Thank you. I said it much better than I did <laughs> the you. Marie oh. one. I thought you were, pronou- <laughs> were saying how good I was when I yes, didn't say that. Yes, you also did a good job pronouncing this cool name. Yeah, thank you. And uh, congrats to Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Hey, man, he, he did some good stuff. So yeah. he gets kind of villainized, and it's specifically because of he of his description and his kind of first theory, which, give him credit, because he just, you know, he came up with some idea. He's just spitballing. Yeah. And he saw these giraffes. And so he said, well, this, uh, you must be able to, um, in order to pass on to your, um, your offspring a trait. Uh-huh. You would have to develop that trait, or you could develop that trait during your lifetime. Okay. So imagine I am a uh, a really good baker. I develop and I learn this new skill of baking, and I would pass that through my genes onto my brood, Thank you. and then they would then become great bakers. Okay. And that would become their evolutionary trait. The that bakers. was that's kind of what he was thinking. So he would say that. I see that these giraffes are have to stretch. So if if the biggest tallest giraffe stretches its neck and it can get to have these higher things, um, I forgot the term that he used. It was like um, uh, nervous plasma or something like that. Like basically, you get more. Your nervous system creates this certain special like uh, pixie dust. Okay, and then that becomes a trait of you that you can pass on to your next giraffe. Wow. So if I stretch my neck out and I have the biggest, tallest neck that I've been stretching, when I then have my children, they will inherit that new trait of stretchiness that I created during my lifetime. I see. So have a couple generations and you can get these really tall neck giraffes. Is it like, uh, is there is there a better chance of passing that trait on to your offspring if it's like really beneficial to you well that's the theory at least uh, again this is lamarckian evolution okay so he would say yes and if you don't use it you would lose it (laughs) been there guy (laughs) exactly so oh we don't need our tails anymore so i'm just i don't use my tail so over a couple generations my basically this this fancy nervous system pixie dust just kind of gets rid of it and you're you just change okay so some people thought about that then like well that doesn't sound quite right because then theoretically that would happen much faster you know yeah and so what he wasn't quite appreciating was a the boring nuances of science and genetics and b he wasn't appreciating the time that has to go into this enter this other guy Charles Darwin and his other friend, uh, or I guess they weren't really friends, um, Alfred Russell Wallace can we call him Chucky D? yeah let's call him Chucky D Chucky D and uh What's the other AFW. Guy's name? AF Dubs. Alfred. What what did I just say? Russell. Let's say, A-R. let's Dang call it. him let's call him A Dubs. A Dubs. Chucky right. D and A Dubs. Chucky D and A Dubs were just walking through the forest looking at a bunch of butterflies. Well, your name is Casey <laughs> and you're here to say. Oh, you're the best rapper, my god. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Oh, you could rhyme that with a Casey. Oh yeah. Oh God. We yeah, we could. We're All here right. to talk about a Casey. A Casey. I hate this. I'm the worst rapper. I can't even. I whenever I try to rhyme more than one thing at a time, I'm always just like, <laughs> Yeah, rhyming is hard on the fly. It's so hard. Everyone who can do it, I'm so impressed. I benefit from being a songwriter that doesn't rely on improvisation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good for you. I benefit from just running anytime I have to write a song. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, A Dub. Thank you. And Chuck Chucky e. D. They both came up with this idea kind of together but separately and uh. it's been, it was a huge huge big deal way back when i could tell you all about it um but basically in science there's like this idea of um preeminence or like getting saying something first not preeminence oh. but um getting the i forgot the term again because i've never done it i, I understand care. this though i mean it's it's sort of the way that modern like social media out news outlets work like yeah whoever publishes the story first like they 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 won exactly and everyone else has to reference them yes yes this is exactly it okay so who came up with the theory of evolution first there's been people who've written literal books on this wow but i actually read a book it was, it's called the the song of the dodo which talked Aww. all about this it was a delightful book okay. i highly recommend it i tried 
Interesting. And uh, so what it was is he came up with not the theory of evolution. Like I said, that already had been there. He came up or they came up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. And this is a big thing that everyone like misunderstands a lot. You know, the term um, survival of the fittest. Yeah, 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 yeah. It means not quite what people think it means because it just means if you're more fit, then you and your offspring will survive probably more likely. Doesn't mean that you will, but okay. more often than not. Okay. So if you were a population of things, a population of, let's say, giraffes, and all the giraffes were on average about the same size, then you over time, if you just play out the averages over literally thousands of generations, and you have these acacia trees that start putting out, or not acacias, the vachelia trees, mm. they start putting out all these thorns, then only the super tallest of the tall are going to actually eat the, the leaves, right? Right. It's not that they developed the height in order to do that. As one tree got taller, the elf or the the giraffes got taller. It just happened to be if I was j- like you, how tall are you? I'm six foot two inches. I am five nine. Okay. If we could not go up on our uh, our tip toes, and I was just trying to eat whatever is at my mouth level, if you had more things that were at your mouth level, another four inches worth of height, five uh-huh. inches, I guess technically, then. You get an extra five inches of stuff to eat. You're going to get a little bit bigger. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Maybe if we all have to run from a lion, you're going to be just a little bit faster. This is the big difference between Darwinian evolution and Lamarckian evolution is that it's a gene that is developed, but you already had that gene. You have all your genes that you have right now. Those are the only things you can pass on to your brood. Yes. You cannot develop anything right now in terms of genes and pass that on. Okay. So Lamarckian is more like you you can you know it's like a video game like if if you want to get good at using swords Mm -hmm. you got to up your sword level yeah and so you use swords a bunch and you get you level up in swords and so you get better at using swords Uh darwinian is like you are set with your dice rolls at the beginning of this game and you cannot get any higher in those skills. Yes. And now take that on a, on a population level. Okay. Where if you, let's say, again, in the sense of these giraffes, um, it would be that just over thousands of generations of these giraffes, mm-hmm. the ones that ended up making just slightly more babies or had just more babies that survived just a little bit more of the time, over a really long period of time, yeah. those are the ones that will end up being more successful, more fit, and then that is the survival of the fittest. I think I got what you're, I get yeah. what you're putting down. All right. Yeah. So that is the theory that everyone came up with. And so they everyone makes fun of Lamarck because they're like, what an idiot. He can't do that. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. That's not fair. He was like on the cutting edge of science at yeah. the time. If there's... It's, it's like someone coming up with a theory about physics and like, how does this quark work? Quark work? Quark work. work. Like quark work. He, if you just come up with a theory and then like a hundred years later, everyone's like, that's so completely wrong because of what we know now, yeah. then people are going to make fun of you for it. It's like, no, you, you, no one had any idea. You still worked hard you on You still it. worked really hard. Credit for you, you quark worker. Yeah, I'm a Lamarck stan. Yeah, I think, I think I'm more fine. Lamarck than Darwin, honestly. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. You just keep standing on your tippy toes and let's, we'll see what happens. I like the underdog, Casey. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. So, yeah, so that was the big thing that um, people came up with. And so for many years, this is what people have actually kind of talked about with um, this. This is what we had talked about and wanted to talk about with how these trees developed. Yeah, let's like, do yeah, it. Over time, the theory would go that as you had a uh, the giraffes, like again, thousands of generations worth of giraffes. Over time, they would slowly but surely, their population, the level and the the size of their bodies and their necks of an entire population would over time switch and shift to being longer and longer and longer. Right. Then you have trees that at the same time, over thousands of generations, would slowly but surely develop just a little bit higher, a little bit higher, and you get this arms race between the tree <laughs> and the giraffe, where the tree would constantly be doing that. But then... Where does that end? You know what I mean? Yeah. Does it end like, are we in the middle of it or what's going on? So people really are kind of thinking about that. They're like, well, maybe they just struck a balance because the ecosystem would not allow these trees to get any taller for whatever reason. Maybe there's just not enough water. Okay. And it's like, okay, maybe that's possible, but giraffes have been around for a long time and these trees have been around for a long time. So 
how long does it take? Maybe we are just in the middle of this, you know, eons long transition where the, this arms race is going to end up having giraffes that get too tall. They can eat every single tree and all the trees die. Right. And then the giraffes die because there's no more trees. Theoretically. Yeah. And then you get the cycle that starts over again after, you know, another hundred millions of years and you get this new tall animal, tall tree kind of thing. That's plausible. Maybe, maybe not. So these other people came in and they're like, well, wow. What about this? And there's another fun thing that I want to talk about because this always comes up and I should preface this. I am a tree person. I'm not a genetics person. Genetics are extremely complicated. Yeah. Um, but I'm more of the genetics person. Yeah, I know. I should really. You kind of come to me with your genetics questions. I've been meaning to ask you to take over right now because I'm lost. Well, it's funny. Right behind you, I have my master's in genetics on the I, wall. Why didn't I never see that before? Yeah, well. God, it's just beautiful. It's because I'm not tall enough. <laughs> Damn it. Casey, that was good. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, so this last bit is um, there's so some people are like, well, actually, I don't think that's quite how it works. It hasn't been this arms race of the tree getting taller and the giraffes getting taller because they've been around for millions of years. So, wouldn't they just keep on getting taller? Somebody and taller? would have had to have won by exactly. now. Exactly, that's yeah. their argument. So, or be uh, like fifty feet tall. <laughs> yeah, these massive giraffes. So, wow. other people say, you know, there's all these different. This is why I'm saying I'm not a genetics person because there's a thousand million other things that come in. Yeah. So maybe the taller you get, the worse your knees are, which means you're going to break your knees more often and you're going to get eaten. Tell me about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. See, so once you get to 6'2", your knees just I mean, just break off. It's, it's true. No, oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> I have oh, terrible knees. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm also incredibly out of shape. Continue. Yeah, what are you talking about? The So uh, this next thing is sexual selection. So some people are like, actually, here's a, here's a, here's a ball out of left field, mm. as they say in sports. You would actually have the development of the tall neck in a giraffe mm -hmm. because of one of two reasons a the bigger tougher giraffe the way that they fight it's called necking yes you've heard of this you've seen well it? no but i i like <laughs> can i already know what you're talking about yeah it's not it's not the necking that we would usually refer to no. you know where you go out and you find your your hawthorn boughs and you go out into the woods <laughs> you get your sweetheart <laughs> and you do some necking yeah exactly this is when you find the other suitor that's trying to find your sweetheart and you bash your neck against theirs until they give up hell yeah Ugh. that's some animal kingdom shit it's damn straight it casey is. if we ever do a live show of completely arbitrary can we end with you and i giraffe necking <laughs> yes we can that sounds good <laughs> i'm gonna grow out my little horns just so <laughs> just so i can have a little like little evolutionary leg up on you well i'm gonna get started on my uh, long neck now with my yeah. evolutionary pixie i'm gonna dust. do it yeah because you're gonna use you're gonna use the lamarckian theory that's right i'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna oh sleep. my god your neck's growing right now i'm gonna sleep every night in my neck stretcher <laughs> that's a good idea so, uh, yeah, so they would, so this last bit, this last little throw in is called sexual selection. That's great. Where it could be that where the two males are fighting. And so they've grown these long necks so they can bash them into each other. Yeah. Or the lady giraffes are just like, I dig a long neck. That long neck looking good. <laughs> I want that long neck. And then you take other animals, um, like the, the peacock or the birds of paradise where they develop these crazy amounts of like they spend so much time and energy and literal gene space to develop these wild displays and these techniques yeah. to get the lady birds and they just go wild but then sometimes like mm -hmm. a peacock for example it doesn't actually help them it's a hindrance to them hmm. because now they have this gigantic appendage of uh, feathers that does nothing but attract mates but it also like makes you heavier. You're not quite as uh, quick. Maybe you have uh, you can't fly through things as swiftly. So you get these other like drawbacks. So if it's strictly evolution in the sense of the fittest, then nothing would develop anything that's fancy. That's fascinating. Yeah, we see this all over the place. Dating is hard. Dating is hard, and so you have sexual selection that comes in. So the question is, the best giraffe is not only the one that can reach the tallest of the leaves on the tallest of a chelia tortilus, mm -hmm. but they also have to be tough enough to bash all the other necks that come near anything that they're looking for. They got to look good while they're doing it. Yeah. All these things come two into birds, play. Two birds, man. Why, why not all of them? No, two giraffes. All right. <laughs> we are we're talking about birds, okay. I say I say it's a little of everything, right? It is, yeah. So in terms of evolution, you know, let's draw this back to the trees, of course, is 
there is this arms race that's going on, but it's always difficult unless it is super clear where like one bird is dependent on the seeds of this one tree or like um, fig trees and fig wasps where the fig wasps are literally 100% uh, evolved to live in one specific kind of fig tree. Yeah. Then one goes extinct. The other, by definition, is going to go extinct because they just they can't survive off anything else. Meanwhile, uh, with this arms race, you can have these trees that are developing these things, but then you would have all these other things that come into play with the giraffe. So maybe the tree is only getting taller to and growing thorns only in response to how the lady giraffes think a male giraffe looks. <laughs> So it's like you, you see these like evolutionary strings that are kind of connected yeah. and it's like, wait a second, is that true? It's like, well, maybe. It sounds like, you know, like in a movie when like an investigator has like a, a, a cork board and there's oh, like yeah. a bunch of strings <laughs> attached exactly to pictures. Is. This is <laughs> Lamarck sitting in his in his in his parlor yeah, rubbing his head. Smoking a pipe. Yeah. 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 He and uh, he and um Watson were very close. Not not um not uh Holmes. Oh, just Watson. Right. Watson was, I, I think he's a character that needs more credit. What I was he doing he, when he wasn't solving crimes? He was actually over here trying to, you know, solve evolution. Yeah. I think he was probably, uh, he's probably a good swimmer. I bet you that's probably true. Yeah. I bet you he swam that channel more than once. Oh yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Well, Casey, uh, uh, stop. Yeah. That's it. I just think it's, <laughs> I just think it's so fascinating. It's, yeah. It's incredible. That's what a, what a complicated web yeah and the and i i have to always like i really like thinking about um the evolution or specifically survival of the fittest and natural selection yeah uh, because i hate like when i was growing up like people would always give it um they would just pass it off out of hand because they're like uh the survival of the fittest like you know the, the biggest toughest survives and it's like that is just not true right half the time a frog that is just smarter is going to basically find the women frogs as they're climbing up and jump on them. And the lady frogs are like, well, I'm just going to keep going. But you have the smarter frog that ends up mating with the, the female or a cuttlefish that happens to be super, super clever. And it like rolls itself in and acts a certain way and gets to mate with this other uh, female while the big one who's like, well, I'm really tough, just is so dumb that it can't even figure out that there's this other little cuttlefish that's coming in. I think what we're encountering here is a matter of vocabulary and semantics it totally is fitness can be mental fitness uh -huh. emotional fitness yeah <laughs> uh and also physical fitness you know but exactly it takes it takes a village it takes a village and the evolution between plants and animals and like what we're doing right now the last kind of like piece to add on to this puzzle is that evolution never stops yeah it's going on right now right this second exactly things are evolving things are evolving but that's the thing it's on such a scale to where yeah. i'm looking at this plant right in front of me i'm looking at you those things are not evolving because a thing does not evolve a population of things evolves. oh interesting and so that is what drives it it's the population dynamics and the population um fitness that ends up moving that population to a different form over thousands of generations wow case that's yeah. that's a that is my biggest takeaway from Ugh, that was fascinating excellent and yeah. then yeah you look at it sorry i didn't mean to cut you off no i was just gonna transition yeah so you look at it with trees and that's been going on for literally millions and millions and millions more years than it has with half the animals that exist right now right because they move and they actually have a much more a much quicker timeline okay um in terms of how they evolve any given tree is going to live for 80 years or more and they have to take a lot longer for these uh, population effects to really put the pressure and change it. I see. Um, so when you have the evolution of animals, the evolution of trees, who knows what's leading to what? Yeah. Uh, but they have this insane amount of connection that when you really start to pick it apart and think about it, it's it's like you're saying that draw board with all these strings and these photos mm -hmm. and these little push pins, it expands out to things you could not even imagine. Just infinite. Infinite. It's crazy. Wow. Casey, clap. <sighs> Go ahead and... I'm sweating. You want some water? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to drink some water. I'm not going to drink this kombucha. It's like a poison. <laughs> I think this is a fantastic time to transition to our rating of the Umbrella Thorn. All right. 
Uh, and I say we also give a second rating to giraffes. I think they've earned it. I think that's fair. I'm going to give them a Lamarckian rating where the better the giraffe in its lifetime, the higher the rating is going to get. Now we're talking. Yeah. Casey is a resident expert. We doth begin with you. All right, Alex. Uh, you got what? a really good name for that. All right, Alex. Oh, you thanks. Know, like, like Trebek or something. Yeah, I don't love my name. You don't? No. Nah. I'll call you something else. No. <laughs> Maybe I do you. like it. No. <laughs> well, well, Casey, moving too fast here. When you said that, let's evolve like, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, I was like, "Wait, no, I don't want that." <laughs> Good. Uh, okay, so here, here's my review of the stream. Um, I think these are just some of the most fascinating trees um, because they have evolved the ability to react in like a certain time frame. So it's mostly tropical where they grow, but they do have wet and dry seasons. So there's a seasonality with how they grow. Mm. Um, but the thing about them is that I love a tree that can fight back. Hell yeah. That's something that is just so fascinating to me. That's great. And another thing is that sometimes ants will live with them and like fight with them. I'll, we're going to cover that another time. It's like the opposite of a lodgepole pine that just lets itself be <laughs> yeah. devoured by bark beetles. Yeah. It's just, just like, like, well, this is my life now. <laughs> these are my cones. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. The acacia is just like, bite me again. I yeah. don't think so. Bite you back. Yeah. Or the vichelia. I think that is, I just think it's so cool. You bite into it and a giraffe eats a section and they're like, oh, that was a really good section. They come back next year yeah. and that section is like <laughs> like thorned off and like the leaves are just small enough to where you have to bite an entire bit of thorn through. I just think that's the raddest thing. I wonder if that's also maybe why giraffes have such tremendously long tongues. That is. I, that's the theory, yeah, yeah, over time. that that, But that, ideally, I, don't, I, I would assume that that is strictly um, so that they could get in between right. like a little snake pop it off and then just whoop, yeah exactly out. <laughs> exactly uh so i'm gonna give i'm gonna give this acacia thorn a, a, a 7.8 great yeah exactly that's I'm, fantastic i tried to rhyme again 7.8 great i should have been like yeah mate you got it mate dang it casey uh what about giraffes what do you give giraffes uh i'm gonna give giraffes uh of the animal like oh this did is, you did you pluralize giraffes with a v oh, i like did that I giraffes no I like not like knife let's do it <laughs> Giraves. Giraves. Uh, I I'm gonna give a giraffe a nine a seven point. The, no, no, dang it! Singular rest. Dang it! <laughs> I can't keep track. Of try this. again. Slow down and try again. Right. I hello Alex. NPR it up. Yeah, I'm gonna NPR real fast. Hi there. Welcome back to <laughs> KEXZ Radio. KEXZ. K, I just made something up. Oh, K uh, K A K A S E. K C A. More like K A S E. This is exactly what it is. Uh huh. All right. This episode is chaos. Giraffes. Giraffe. It's already plural. What does it get? I like giraffes 7.6. Okay, great. I think that they're really cool the way they neck. Just out of reach of that. Uh, <laughs> Just out of reach of the acacia or the vichella. 7.8 uh, golden reach. cones of honor for the umbrella thorn. That's from right. Casey Clapp. That's right. Because it's a tree that fights back. Put it in the books. Casey, uh, I'm going to make my review very quick because we this episode is just madness beautiful and we are wrapping up our review at one hour seven minutes which i think is <laughs> from a producer standpoint just unacceptable yeah thanks for sticking with us <laughs> i'm gonna give the umbrella i oh, i oh, i like a f- <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> i like a few things about the umbrella thorn i also like that it fights back i think yeah. that's fantastic i did not know that it was a part of the pea family that's mm-hmm. charming fabulous yeah it's a fabulous pea tree uh, I also like just it's it's sort of silhouette is mm-hmm. so iconic yeah and it's such a beautiful like majestic tree it's you like that scene with the the sunrise coming up yes and it's just like reaching its arms out and soaking in the sun it's so yeah. beautiful yeah uh, I really love how you know it can't grow that tall so it is just like fuck it I'll grow out yeah it's what I can do you know and it does a great it does a great job it looks like an umbrella uh I like I like that it switched families. Yeah. Gena- Genus. G- gen- genre. Genre. Yeah. I give the Umbrella Thorn 7.4. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty good. Right down the middle of the upper register of the cone scale. I think that makes a lot of good sense. Cone scale. Yeah, it's a cone scale. Uh giraffes. I'll give a I'll give giraffes an eight. An eight. An eight point oh. You know who They're hates giraffes? Enough. 
who in a really funny weird way is dan Harmon, the creator of community really and rick and morty why would anyone why would anyone hate it he goes on a I youtube it he goes on great big long rants about giraffes about giraffes yeah. just is like i hate giraffes and basically he hates what we just talked about the evolution of the giraffe's neck <laughs> you know what i bet you he's a lamarckian <laughs> i bet you he's a lamarckian that's why i connect so much with yeah him. we gotta we gotta talk we gotta reach out to him and like let him down gently yeah, let's reach out to Dan Harmon. Yeah, Dan, we got news for you. It's not what you think. <laughs> and if it is what you think, we're sad you think that. Yeah, sorry, Dan. Anyway. Uh, but also, I, I would be, uh, it would be a pleasure to, to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. do, do, do reach out to us, though. He'll Seriously? definitely hear this, right? Oh, yeah, I think everyone listens to this. I think he's a fungal associate. Yeah, probably. Casey, let's move on to our completely arbitrary Q&A. This week, our question is from listener E.G. Smith. Let me just say to E.G. Smith, if you are not a novelist yet, you need you probably need to get on that. Yeah, that's because a, you have the perfect novelist name. Most definitely, the newest novel by E.G. Smith. Hundred percent classic literature. E.G. Smith. If you do get us, we'll give you an NPR uh, critics review of it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, E.G. Smith asks, "Hello." I'm a big fan of the podcast. Hey, thanks. EG, we're a fan of you. That's right, EG. I had a question that only occurred to me this season as you talk about trees from around the world. Oftentimes, you talk about seeing trees being planted in Portland or the greater U.S. in general. Yes. That came from different parts of the globe. uh, I believe EG is referring to maybe the monkey puzzle most recently. Ah, yes. Japanese cherry. Yes, also the Japanese cherry. Well, this whole season, they even even said that. are invasive species a big concern when it comes to trees? Mm. Have there been cases where an introduced species outcompeted with native trees in a blatantly harmful way? Ugh. Do they grow so slowly that it's harder to tell when compared to quickly breeding animal populations? That's an interesting question. Wait, say that question again. Do they grow... S- so slowly that it's harder to tell when compared to quickly breeding animal populations. Upon rereading, I actually don't know what that means. I'm not sure, but I'm going to give a stab at it anyway because I like doing it. Thanks so much and looking forward to hearing about more trees from around the world. E.G. Smith, she, they. Casey. E.G. Let's talk invasion. All right. So the uh, trees of tree invasion. Yeah. The answer is yes. That has happened. It happens often. Okay. The quintessential example, for better or worse, in at least in the United States, is the tree of heaven. We, oh. I think we've talked about it once or twice. Us in the uh, forestry industries refer to it as, I'm sorry, the tree of heaven hell <laughs> yeah that's the standard joke everyone, everyone I, I said that it. to we were gonna do a tree of heaven episode <laughs> and i said i've got a great title for it what about tree of hell and he rolled his eyes in the same way that i roll my eyes at casey <laughs> when we talk about making a, a video and he wants to start with oh hey didn't see you there <laughs> yeah it's the best way to do it every industry has its out oh, it's overplayed cliches no one's ever had that no one's ever made a video like that before alex <laughs> Anyway, sorry I roasted you. Ouch! It's all right. I have an umbrella above me, mm. and it's thorny. Mm. So, all right, here's the answer. Yes, a hundred percent. So, for those of you who may not be aware, we should first talk about this idea of invasive species. Uh, an invasive species um, is a species of plant or animal that is not native to that region, but has escaped and naturalized into the uh, the environment. Most of the time, it would be in an environment that is a natural area of some kind. Okay. So um, if you have a species of tree that is from China, someone brought it over and planted it in England. And now in England, it grows itself and repropagates itself. Oh. People do not have anything to do with it. If it puts out seeds, those seeds will grow and those trees will then grow up and that or those plants or those little babies because this can be any living thing really. Yeah. And they will cause trouble, whatever trouble it is. Okay, so part of being invasive includes outcompeting other trees who live there natively. Exactly, correct. So the tree of heaven, again, quintessential example. Um, it is just one of the best trees in the world it's a super competitive tree it can do anything it's native to china and it will grow almost anywhere i've seen it growing in the like highest latitudes not maybe like super duper high but like um high latitudes up in canada i've seen it down in southern uh southern california 
and it's growing just just as well in each one of these places. Interesting. Um, so what happens is an invasive species can just natural naturalize itself and grow, but the difference that really makes it kind of gives it a, a leg up is that it does not have any natural predators or natural oh. other forces and pressures that keep it down. Because it's not at home. Exactly. And it is now, for whatever was happening at home, maybe it was soil, water, another insect, another yeah, kind of tree, yeah. something, it would be in balance more or less. And you bring it outside and it just proliferates for whatever wow. reason. This reminds me of, I'm not, a, I'm not a comic book person, but it reminds me of uh, Superman, right? Superman came to Earth. Uh-huh. We have a different atmosphere. Yeah. So he can fly. Ah, uh, yes. And he becomes Superman only when he comes to Earth because exactly. he is an invasive species. In that regard. Or at least he's an exotic species because I should I should also give a the other side of that. Okay. An exotic species is one that's just not from that wherever you're at. I so see. in Portland, literally anything that doesn't grow native. And I say native because there's a lot of people who are like, well, what is native? That's a whole other conversation. Okay. Um, but- uh, let's Douglas fir. It grows here. It's a native tree to Oregon, the western side especially. Mm-hmm. If you plant that over on the east coast, it would be an exotic species, not invasive, not invasive because it does not naturally or naturalize and grow and outcompete other things over there. Gotcha. For whatever reason, um, so there are trees that do that. Now, the over here in Portland, tree of heaven, like I said, anywhere in North America, tree of heaven. Yeah. Um, but then you also have a different kinds of cherry trees that are invasive around here. Hmm. Um, there is the Norway maple is slightly invasive. The holly is actually pretty rough around here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, English ivy. It's not a tree. It's a vine, but man, it's a problem. Man, it, oh man. It, I love that aesthetically though, looking at a tree covered in ivy. Oh yeah. If you go to the Southwest, um, the uh, this is the best example actually, um, the Bradford pear. Uh-huh. Yeah. They planted that down in like say Missouri and they're like, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And then one of them decided it was going to make seeds, made some seeds, pop. Now it is just this super awful, um, invasive down in the, um, uh, sort of lowland forests in Missouri and sort of that central Midwestern kind of South area. We will talk about the Bradford. Pair. Oh yes, we will. So that one is invasive there. Um, English holly over here. Uh, kudzu is a super big problem if you're in the, um, the eastern uh, forest, like in the Appalachia, um, go to like Cherokee, North Carolina, and every tree is covered with this massive, huge vine called kudzu. Oh, wow. Oh, God, it's terrifying. It just, it, it looks awful. Like, it looks like it's just like a spider webs. Exactly, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, down if you go to um, yeah. California, the um, eucalyptus tree is super invasive in certain places down there. If you go down to the southern uh, kind of coastal side of California. And um, so the issue with this is that you have nothing that's stopping it. And because you have nothing that's stopping this tree from growing, it can just grow and grow and grow. But a lot of times, because the ecosystem is not attuned to how that tree grows, and I mean the ecosystem in its grandest sense, it is growing almost unchecked. But the ecosystem, because rather, it is growing unchecked because the ecosystem doesn't know what to do with it. It's not prepared for it. And the ecosystem cannot learn to check it until you have thousands of generations of something that's like, well, I guess I'm going to learn to eat this tree. And if you take the um, eucalyptus, for example, they have very specific, um, it's actually why it's used in so many different things. Um, they're like antifungal and anti-insectic, hmm. insecticidal, anti-insect, oh, insect. That's why you find it in like, uh, soaps and yeah, exactly, yeah. shower cleaners. Yeah. Stuff. It also, I mean, it smells good. It smells fantastic. That smell though is what helps stop it from, oh. or that chemical is help what stops things from eating it. Interesting. Um, especially down in its native area in a lot of cases. Um, so when you bring it up here, it's just unpalatable. So no insect native to California is like, yeah, I'm going to go eat that. It's like, no, I'm going to go eat literally anything else and it's going to be great. So it just grows out of control. It grows out of control. Because it grows out of control, it can outcompete other trees and other things. When it outcompetes all these other things and nothing wants to eat it, what happens to all, the, all those native things that normally would eat the native thing that's there? they end up perishing as well. I see. So you get these kind of dead zone forests where um, there's another southern uh, tree or another shrub. It's a uh, kind of a huckleberry, or not huckleberry. Um, oh, it's a smelly thing. What is it? Ugh, I'm just completely, I said huckleberry, and now my brain is just oh, huckleberry. Oh, you're stuck huckleberry. on huckleberry. Oh, gosh, I'll get there. It's a little shrub. Honeysuckle. Honeysuckle. Yes. That's pretty close to- Type of foliaceae. To uh, huckle. 
Knuckles yeah. shower. What is it? Huckleberry. Huckleberry. Yeah, Jesus. don't get me back on it. Um, so it's just this shrub that grows down in um, outside Columbia, Missouri, just as an example. And it grows and takes over the entire understory. There are no other shrubs that grow there. It Jeez. outcompetes everything. And because it does that, it ends up taking away the light for things that would grow underneath it. And it takes away the mm. secondary layer for other things that would want to grow up and take that kind of shrub layer section. I see. Because it does that, um, you get almost no birds that are there because they don't eat that fruit. They can't make their nests in that area. So the birds slowly but surely leave as this invasive species spreads out. So same thing happens with anything else, where if you have an invasive species that can run wild, it runs wild, out competes and pushes out your native flora, which then ends up inevitably pushing out the native fauna, which are the animals. And then you just get this this repeating cycle because nothing can check it and you end up getting it happening in, you know, positive feedback, you know, in a yeah. negative way. Fascinating. Yeah. So it, they are, they're super bad. Uh, they're not in exotic species. It's just great. You can plant a... Um, uh, a um, monkey puzzle. Mon- I was going to say monkey puzzle yes. in Portland is an exotic species. Totally. You can plant it, but it's not going to grow and outcompete things. For sure. But um, a holly tree, you don't want to plant English holly around here because if it has those little berries, they're going to go out because birds do like to eat them. Yeah. And then they out- outcompete everything. English laurel is another example. Um, almost anything from... Uh, England is invasive here, but also vice versa. Oh. There's invasive like rhododendron that it was planted there. If you ever go out to the beach on the uh, on the coast of Oregon here, uh-huh. um, have you ever seen that beautiful grass that's growing? Yes. That is 100% invasive. It wow. was not here 200 years ago. No kidding. No kidding. It's so beautiful. It is. It looks so like quintessential, but it's quintessential for different parts of the world where we like see that aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Here, we used to just have dunes that went straight into the forest or straight into the ocean. Wow. And now those dunes have all these grasses, but because those grasses are coming, now they're solidifying the soil or the sand starting to drop a certain thing. Now you get certain shrubs that move in. When the shrubs move in, they then create a layer of soil on top of the sand. Then trees move in. And now you have what would be considered, what some have considered, I'm still dubious about it, an invasive native population that now has come and outcompeted the grass, which was the initial invader. And now it's taken away the dune habitat only because it has now, the, the habitat has changed. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's kind of like, well, is that good? Is that bad? It's a native process. Yeah. But it's based off of an invasive species. I don't know how to think about it. I don't either. Yeah. It's very complicated. I do know that I like those grasses though. Yeah. Right. Suffice it to say, yes, there are invasive trees that come around. They are just like any other organism uh, where you can have an invasive or an invasion, so to speak. Casey, that was a brilliant answer. Oh, I try and my best. A brilliant question by E.G. Smith. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, e. wait, quick. What was that other section? I know you. we should go, but what is that? What was, this? What was the second bit? Oh, do they grow so slowly that it's harder to tell when compared to quickly breeding animal populations? Yes. No, it's almost exactly the same. An invasive species trait, lots of seeds, and they are prolific seeders, and well, they all those things will grow. Cool. Yes. So, no, you can tell. It's almost exactly the same. An invasive species has the same characteristics if it's a plant, if it's an animal, if it's a tree, if it's a shrub. Lovely. There you go. Casey, we've come to the end of this insane episode. Man, I feel good. <laughs> I feel I, like it was direct. I feel like I'm dreaming. <laughs> uh, I do, before we sign off here, I do want to say something. Oh, yes. And I've been nervous to say it. Oh, gosh. Do you want me to? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll do it. Uh, as probably a, a, f- a few people who follow us on Instagram know, mm-hmm. my beloved dog, Solo, uh, passed away yesterday. Yes, um, it was peaceful, you know, it, everything went as it should have, uh, obviously heart wrenching and awful. Um, but I am alive and everybody has been so fucking thoughtful and kind and supportive. Thank you so much. Um, it's amazing how a community can build over something like this and we really, yeah, we appreciate the support here. Yeah. Yeah. And we appreciate Solo. We appreciate you, Alex. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, there's like a million other things I want to say, but I also don't want to like uh, full on cry on Mike. Yeah, which oh, that's fair, but we'd it's, allow it. Uh, but basically, um, yeah, I feel I feel very appreciative. Uh, it was a long road. Yeah, it was a long time. Six months uh, of of trying to make him better, mm. and you know, time and age caught up. And, uh, but he was, uh, he will live on 
this is incredibly cliche, but it's what I can think of. It will live on in my heart forever. R.I.P. Solo. I think that's I think that's exactly true. Casey, Alex, thanks for being here, bud. Always, thanks for being here with us. And let's just dedicate this episode to Solo. I think it's fair. Thank you. I would like to do that. And I'd also like to dedicate every other episode to Solo. That sounds good to me. Can we do that? Well, he was the producer. I mean, he's true. without him, it's a silent majority back there. It's true. Love that boy. Yeah, we do. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, sorry to end on such a downer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next week. That's right, with We're- more trees from around the world in our completely arbitrary world tour. It's... It's going to be in the Northern Hemisphere, I think. We think. But I don't know. You know, the trolls also have a world tour. What? Alex, we got to go. I Cut have nieces. Off. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening, Nisa. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Completely Arbitrary is produced by Alex Croson and Casey Clapp. Our production consultant is Olivia Frankie. Our artwork is by Jillian Barthold, and our music is by the Mini Vandals. Thanks for listening.